Good evening. Let's make a video. It's been too long. Let's build a 6.5 PRC Savage Prefit Barrel. I'll walk you through the steps and how I do it here in my shop. So maybe you'll want to get one from me someday. We'll see. First step is uh, cleaning it. The reason I clean it is so we can do the bore inspection. So let's get to cleaning. So this step, these are brand new barrels. I just used some Hoppies number nine. Dip my old finger in there, shake her up and down. And swab the bore. Do this three or four times to uh, get rid of all the oil and contaminants that might be in there. Depending on how dirty it is, I'll run a brush through it. But this one, that first one, is immaculately clean. I use clamps and the vise to hold the barrels. Uh, don't really care for the jaws on the vise that much. They don't stay there well. Yeah, she's pretty clean. So next step, we'll take a dry patch and go through it to get rid of all our hoppies. So when we look at the barrel, it doesn't have all that oily shine to it when we do our bore inspection. Okay, it's good, clean, and dry. So now I'll grab my test long bore scope and we'll give you a peek inside the bore. This is just a $150 tablet from Walmart, Samsung. Sure that's showing up. But this barrel is a six groove, one and eight twist Wilson. They're all lapped by Wilson at the factory within two tenths. And everyone I've inspected has just been beautiful inside. And this one's really no different. Go in, turn it 180 degrees, come back out. She's nice. This is going to be a nice barrel for somebody. And then we'll turn another 90 just to make sure. Yeah, no flaws that I've seen. So, life is good there. The next thing we're going to do is set it up or get it set up so we can uh, do our pressure flush. So let's do that. So before I get too carried away showing you how I do it to get it set up, I'll give you a little tour of my oil pressure flush system. This flushes all the chips out of my reamer. So that's a pump. I got it on a suction. The oil gets filtered before it goes through my uh, carbonator pump. I got a line that goes through there, through the lathe, and it comes up here to a manifold. This manifold, this one's my supply. This regulates my pressure. This sends it to the barrel. And this is my uh, <clears throat> drain. So if I wanna blow the oil out of the barrel, it goes through here. I then have a line rigidly run across the front of my lathe, out of the way, to a swivel, 90 degree fitting, to a quick disconnect, okay? This quick disconnect goes into my rotary union. This spins nice and free, which goes into a half inch piece of pipe that I uh, put an ER32 collet on. The reason I did that is I made a spider, or call it, for the back of my spindle. And that ER32 collet clamps on there and holds the pipe against the barrel. So what I do is I take the end of the barrel here and I 
just take a drill and I cut a 60 degree taper on it. And that 60 degree taper against the rubber tip seals everything up so I don't leak oil all over my shop. Ask me how I know this. So now I gotta cut a chamfer on the other end of the barrel so that rubber tip has something to seal against. I just use a simple high speed uh, countersink tool, half inch. We just need a little flange for that rubber to seal against. Just go get the end of the barrel. <laughs> There we go, just like that, we've got our chamfer cut, so our rubber tip has something to seal against. Pretty simple, it hasn't leaked yet, um, believe it or not I used to never cut the chamfer until I did a 204 barrel one time. And I had oil uh, flying all out of my spindle. So for now, I uh, definitely chamfer all of them because that was a mess. So I've seen a lot of different ways to hold a barrel in jaws. I've seen people use washers that they cut out and split and go around and that works. Um, I've seen people use like a a barrel truing system. It has four bolts, one here, one here, one here, one here, so they can tilt it every which way. Um, they all work fine. I prefer an extremely rigid setup, so I make aluminum collars for all the burls I do. I got a drawer full of them here. Um, these collars have a taper cut inside of them that match the barrel perfectly. It'll hold there by itself. Um, to prevent any scratching or galling on barrels, I just take a piece of construction paper and I fold it like so. And this goes in here like, like this. This is also how I get barrels out of uh, action. That's another video. Now you got a 50-50 chance of getting this right. Did I get this one right? Hey, I got it right. Usually I put them on backwards. So yeah, this goes up to the taper. And uh, I'll tap it with a hammer, a rubber mallet here. And I just put it on the corner of the vise. And I just give it a little tap. Anybody that's done anything with tapers, you uh, you know that that's definitely not going to go anywhere now. We'll just take this excess paper, rip it off, and now we're ready to put it in the lathe to indicate it. So I use the true bore alignment system. Uh, it allows me to, to adjust the barrel so it's perfectly centered to the axis of my spindle bore and my lathe. These four bolts here move the chuck up and down, front to back, and then these four bolts allow it to rotate. So a combination of adjustments, I can get that barrel, no matter how out of whack it is, perfectly true to the center of my, to my machine. So all my cuts are perfectly concentric to the spindle of my lathe. Now in doing that, I do stuff pretty much exclusively off my cross slide. Most guys that you see doing stuff, they use their tail stock for everything. I used to do that. The reason I don't anymore is uh, you gotta turn this a bunch to get any movement, right? This, I mean, I can move it really quick, really fast. Plus, when we do our cuts, including my chambering off this. All my chambering is done off my cross slide or my carriage. <clears throat> if all my measurements are coming off the thing I'm cutting, I think it's more accurate. I'm not saying that the tail stuck way is wrong, just not how I do it. So I'll quit rambling. I'll get the, uh, the barrel in the chuck 
And uh, we'll try to indicate this booger in. So I've done a lot of experimenting with indicating barrels. Um, did the straight shot gunsmithing method. It worked. Um, you got a little play in there. You need two bushings. Uh, they're kind of expensive. The system works, but any play, you get run out. Okay? Then you read online and like, oh, you need the range rods from Pacific to Engage. So I got them. This has a taper cut on it. You drive it into the barrel. You got the bushing. It works. But you take it out and you put it back in. Lo and behold, it doesn't indicate the same way every time. So then you read online more and you're like, oh, well, you need the Grizzly Range Rods. So you put this in here. You go in and out of the barrel. Put an indicator on here. And you indicate it true. That worked probably the best that I've played with prior to getting this little jewel. This right here is an inner rapid indicator. Nice thing about this one, it's got a five inch stylus on it. Five inches is a long ways in a barrel. It's a half thousandth resolution, but when we, that's made for a two and a half inch uh, indicator. When we put the five, each one of them tick marks are now a thousandth of an inch. And like I said, I do everything off my compound rest or carriage so I just have a drill chuck set it on here and then I put my indicator in like so tighten it in so it can't move everything's perfectly aligned perfectly center to the bore so we can indicate if you guys are ever doing this like you see me doing this right here nothing too scientific about it just be dang sure that when you're doing it you have a carriage stop of some sort now why is a carriage stop important the reason it's important because you start going back and forth and back and forth and lo and behold it never fails you go in and you smack your indicator against the back of the barrel. And then you're like, ugh, that was expensive because there's a good chance you're gonna break this. It's a pretty, pretty sensitive piece of equipment. So I always set my carriage stop there, lock it down prior to indicating. So now we've got the barrel in there. Life is good. We can spin it and nothing's happening on our indicator. The reason being we're not touching the lands. So we're gonna go down until the needle starts moving. There the needle starts moving. And we're gonna put it on zero. And hey, we got movement. All that bounces the lands. So I was telling you that barrels aren't perfectly square to the world. When they cut the tapers, they flex a little bit. So we need to make sure that barrel's perfectly concentric to the center of our bore of our lathe. So I start here on one, make sure I'm not on a land, okay? Put it on zero and I just go out. And see how it's about, what are we? Two thousandths out. Go back here to zero. Zero it. Go back here, one. Two, yeah, we're about two thousandths low here. So we gotta raise this barrel up to make it level with the spindle of our bore. How we do that is this adjustment here, we'll raise it up. This is a very finicky process. You always over adjust when you first start doing this. And even after I've been doing it for a while, I still over adjust. So I want to go just a little bit over because we're a half thousand this way. And we'll go back to our starting point, go to zero, go back the other way. Tick, tick, tick. 
One more. Nope, I ain't got enough travel. So we're on zero there. Get you a little better view. So you can see all this madness happening. Go in, tick, tick, tick. All right. So now that barrel is sitting level there on our first number one mark on my uh, my chuck. I had to mark every one of them because otherwise I'd lose track of which one I was turning. So now we'll rotate it 90 degrees and we're going to be on mark two. Okay, we're on zero. One, two, three. Man, we're pretty darn close. Really darn close. One, two, three. Okay. So we can we can consider that a win. So now we got the barrel level up and down 90 degrees to its axis. So now we gotta check the run out. The run out is this, that barrel is gonna be wobbling. So we'll go like this. So <clears throat> watch when it drops. We're high. We're low, we're high, we're low. So we have to uh, get that so it stays bouncing on the same hash mark every time. So we'll go to the low side here, go back one. Okay, we'll split the difference. So we gotta get that to zero because we're on this side, we'll move it to zero. And this one's really easy to overjust. Okay, so now we're gonna tick, tick, tick. Okay, here's the high side, back to the low side. So we're gonna take the needle, turn it so, we're high, we're low, and we're high even on the top and low. So we're gonna find the low side here. We're gonna loosen this a little bit and tighten this, get that one up, I went the wrong way. Get that bad boy to zero. Oh, we're getting closer, woo. Okay, we're just a little low there. So we're gonna Loose this, tighten it up, oh, wrong way again. It's always backwards in my mind. I don't know why I struggle with it so much, but I do. <clears throat> and sometimes you go too much. We're getting pretty darn close. Tick, tick, tick. All right. Final check, we're at zero, zero, zero. Come in, still on zero. Two, zero, zero, zero. That's over four inches of barrel. Zero, 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 and the final one. Zero, zero, I kind of moved it there a second here. Zero, zero. All right, we are wonderful. In and out. We're ready to cut some threads and do some chambering. It's a very timely process. You can see I can wiggle the barrel here by hand, and that's three quarter inch barrel. So, pretty fussy setup to do it, but that just ensures that when that bullet hits the lands, everything's perfectly straight. We do the same setup on the other side when we do the muzzle. Um, four inches of straightness. Once that bullet leaves, this will be 90 degrees, so we can't have a baffle strike. So let's cut this tenon down to 1.060 and uh, install some threads. So this will likely be fairly noisy. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just kind of true up this shoulder. It's cut off with a bandsaw. So we'll true up that shoulder uh, so we can put our live center in the back so we know everything's nice and square to the world and square to the bore that we just indicated. You're going to hear it one. That's my face converter. And then we'll uh, turn on the leg here.
and we'll uh, get this thing squared up. I use a pretty good sized lathe and the reason I do one when I thread barrels I don't have to take the barrel off the machine the barrel can stay attached or barrel off the action it just saves me time I ain't got to worry about re-head spacing anything and another reason is I can take some pretty healthy cuts um, this speeds up everything when we go to do our threading and our profiling. This will be my last cut here. Then we'll throw the live center in so we can uh, turn this down to uh, 1.060 for a Savage Tenon. We got that cut. Bring it in over. I hope this isn't too noisy. Indicated the tail stock, so we're good there. We'll make a truing pass here. To get our dimension and then we'll cut it to finish dimension. Go in, go over. Cut that off. Got something that's round that we can measure. One point six nine five. I do a calculator for everything. One point six nine five minus. 1.060 equals 109 thousandths. That's all we gotta take off. So we'll zero this out. Turn this on. In 108. Should be at 1.065 if we are or 060. 1.061. We'll take it. One point zero six zero. Wonderful. Next thing we got to do is cut this to length for our shoulder. I right, got this roughly a half inch, four ninety three. About right there. And then we need a 1.6 inch tenon. So I'll go zero this out. 1.6, we can go a little over. So we gotta cut this off. So we have 1.6 inches of threads. 
This will go here when we screw on. It won't look really nasty out here. A lot of them will have a really a half inch after the uh, flange so it goes to the taper. I think it just looks better that way. So we'll swap this cutter out for a parting tool. Now you can get into a hurry taking metal out the top, but you never get in a hurry when you're using a parting tool. So we'll slow this down to 205. So the feed rate down. And this is not a fast process. If you get too fast when you're parting, you will uh, you'll be spending some money, I guarantee it. Then chips bind up in there and break off your tip. All right, she's parted. Let's cut our lead for our thread. We want to give our thread something nice to end on. So we'll cut a little bit of a lead here. 30 degree angle. So we got a nice start starting point for our threads to start and end on. Come back with this. We're going to make a fine skim pass just so we got a nice clean contact point. Our parting tool is kind of rough. We'll pull this back out. A nice little chamfer on there to start our lead for our screws. Next thing we're going to do is set up our thread. So that's my threading insert tool. We're gonna go to where it stops. Marks right there. I'm gonna zero out my digital readout up top. We're gonna go back over and over 1.610. 610,000. Okay. And then I'm gonna set my carriage stop here. So you guys can see all this. We got this set at 610. We can zero that out. I got my carriage stop set. So when I come over to here, my thread, my carriage will stop every time. So my threads will go in the same way. I'm gonna set my machine up for 20 threads per inch. All right, so now I got everything set up to thread. We just got to cut the tip. I thread at 500 RPM, which is kind of fast, but I cut my threads in reverse. And make sure I can go to here. Yep, plenty of clearance. First thing I do is take a plunge cut to 65 thousandths. That gets me to my minor diameter. This just gives the tool something to gives it clearance so it can start the thread nice. You're not grinding on your tool as you're cutting any of your threads. So there's 65 thousandths, okay? 
Make sure we're at zero here. Barely touching, okay. So just confirming everything. We got everything zeroed out. That's where our threads start. We got this locked down, so we have a solid stop to go against. And then I have this also zeroed out. <clears throat> I'll feed in 10 thousandths for a couple cuts, and I'll back it to five, and then the three, and then we'll start measuring. When I get close to about 58 to 63 thousandths, we'll start measuring it with the wires. And then uh, once we get close to the wires, this bad boy should fit. So I'm running my lathe in reverse now. I'm gonna go in 10 thousandths. I'm just gonna cut away from the chuck here. Okay, shut it off. Back to zero. Hit our stop. 10 thousandths. Coming around the dial. Start. taking smaller cuts. Coming around to two and fire. Back out. Zero. Out. Over. Into zero. Five more thousand. Start. Take this off, reverse, reverse, and then we'll see if this thing even attempts to go on. It's starting to go, but it's tight. Okay. Over. Go back in with this thing. The deeper I go, the smaller cuts I make, so it seems like it takes a lot longer than the, at the end than the beginning. Do one more cleanup pass. Shut that back up. Pull this out. These savage nuts are really sloppy. It's 
So I do a class three fit. So it screws on there with no issues, but that's still gonna be too tight. So I'll get my thread calculator out. I do that on the Google. Uh, thread calculator. Just go to theoretical machinist. The diameter is a 1.060. We are doing 20 threads per inch. We are 2A, we need to go to 3A for outside or air compute. We're using 29 thousandths wires. We compute. Over our wires should be 1.0712 on the big side. So let's see where we're at here. So here's our gizmo. Let's see if you can see what I'm doing. We're gonna find some threads here. Like so. I should buy a go no go gauge for this, but this thing got around to Alright, our tolerance. 71 to 67. We're 68, so we're good to go. Life is grand. Our outside diameter has got to be 60. It is. So we're threaded. If we get our savage action here, pull this out. It should go on nice and neat. Very, very little play. A little bit, but not a lot. All right, so like I said, I do stuff differently than some people you watch on YouTube or wherever. I use the carriage for as much as I can, including reaming. The reason I do it for reaming is I got my digital readout. So when I move my carriage, I can see within two tenths of where I'm at. So if I wanna go deeper, by two tenths, I just move it in two tenths, right? I have a carriage stop that I can adjust in half thousandths increments. So I got a solid stop. And then I got a dial here that tells me how deep I'm going. So if I want to go clean out every 50 thousandths, I just stop, back out, zero, in another 50. I can do it that way. Everybody that I talk to that I say when I do it this way, they say, well, how do you, how do you true the chuck? When I tell people about this, they try, they can't wrap their heads around how to indicate your reamer holder to the center of the bore, right? Well, how we do this, if you guys have ever used a mill before, we just put the indicator on the spindle head and we indicate it like we would on a mill to find the center of a hole. So we just get it on zero and voila, we're less than a half thou right there. Um, pretty simple. <clears throat> it's a floating reamer holder. It can work up to, what is it? I think they advertise, GSG advertises like 50 thou out of whack. So yeah, we got this indicated within a half thou. Um, <clears throat> we'd have to indicate our tail stock the same way. So this is faster. It's the way I do it. I can use my feed on my uh, carriage. I can clean out my chips faster. Everything's wonderful. Um, it's hard to show on the camera, but you're on the indicator this way on the uh, outer part to get it perfectly straight. There's no tilt on this tool post, so that's good. And then you just go around the barrel of it and that centers it to the axis of the lathe. So that pretty much guarantees we're within less than a thou of the center of our barrel 
off the uh, center of the reamer holder. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> so now that I got our reamer holder centered, right, I lock down our cross slide and then I lock down this guy here, our compound. The reason I do that is so it can't move on us. Okay? Then I come up here and I zero everything out. So now this is perfectly centered and we know if this moves off zero up top, we know our carriage is moved. We can't move it because we got everything locked down. All right, so that's that. Hopefully it makes sense. It's a little different than you see a lot of times. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get our 6.5 PRC reamer out and we're going to find a bushing that fits in there nice and snug so we can uh, ensure our reamer lines up perfectly with the lance. All right, before we start cutting, I always take a pair of calipers and I go from the head to the shoulder measurement. Take a measurement so we're at five one point five seven zero we'll call it and I take that number one point five seven zero and we minus point one two five equals so we can know we can cut past the shoulder we'll say one point four um, and then we we'll, can take our first headspace reading to get us close to the, la the, the last 45 thousands. The reason do I do that, it's hard to tell where exactly you're at. So once I get to the shoulder here, I'll zero out my digital readout. And then we'll just go in 1.4, stop, clean everything out, and take our measurement. It just speeds everything else, speeds everything up for me. So as I was explaining earlier, this is the adapter I made for my ER32 collet. It goes on my oil press flusher system. This just screws into my spindle. This lathe has a three and a quarter inch spindle, which makes it nice. I don't have to break down very many rifles. The only one I had to break down so far is like a Ruger 1 Model 77 uh, to thread that barrel. Otherwise, I can just throw the whole rifle, recoil lug, and all in there. And it's absolutely super simple to uh, thread muzzles that way. There we go. Okay. We got this thing in that cone. Life is good. Slide this in. Tighten up our collet. And voila, we got a nice seal for our pressure flush system. Then we take this. If you guys ever build one of these, strongly recommend hydraulic quick connects. You don't have near the mess all over this place compared to just like a, a hose with a hose clamp or something like that. It just helps me keep it cleaner. So let's go back to the other side and get this chamber cut. All right, we got the right tight fitting pallet on there. We got the cross slide locked down. We got the compound rest locked down. We got the reamer tight. We got the reamer holder indicated. We got the lathe and low. I chamber at 205 RPM. We got our oil pressure flush system on. We're going to turn that on. Going through the circulation, knife is good there. Close that off, start giving ourselves a little bit of flow here. We got a little flow. 
Turn the lathe on. So once we get to this shoulder here, I'll zero out my digital readout. And once that's done, I'll just put it on a time warp for the chamber. All right, so there we are. Got my digital readout zeroed up there. So when that gets to 1.4, you know we're pretty damn close, so we got to do some, some headspace measuring. So I'm going to shut this off and uh, do a time warp, and we'll uh, see you when we're done. We're going to take this thing, slide it here. That's our stop. We're gonna zero out our so we zero zero. We got this thing stopped, so we know where we're at. I'm gonna back this out. Shut off our fluid. Shut off our machine. Sorry. Now we're going to take a measurement and then we're going to make hopefully our final cut. We're going to take this, blow all this crap out of here. This in here. We're going to be a little big, I hope. Thirty-two. So everything worked right. So now we got to take off our last four and a half thousandths, and we'll be golden. So one, two, three, four. Should be ten on there on the digital readout, and we're gold. We should be at 127 to 127.5. Minimum is 125 or 0.125. Maximum is 0 0.130. We should be within headspace. Look at that, seven, three. Oh, look at that. Too much. More money. We just snuck up on it. Perfect. So yeah, we're head spaced. Life is wonderful. 1.127, our minimum is one, two, Five, the maximum is point one three zero. We're gonna take a little chamfer here so we can uh, ensure we got some smooth feeding and not scratch the brass.
All right, the final step that I do here is my chamber inspection. I got a, like I said, I use the cross slide, the compound rest for everything. I got a uh, short test long bore scope here. I run it into the chamber. And in that chamber, you can see my bore, like I showed you earlier. Nice and smooth and neat and tidy with no chatter. All right, there's the lands. You can see them half moon marks right there. That's where the reamer cut. See how glossy it is? And all them lands got cut on the same exact spot. It doesn't get much better than that. I, if there's a better way to do it, I don't know it. That's what we're, that's the, the results we are looking for. Enjoy and God bless.